All right, so here in early 2020, we're talking about upgrading our spiritual life. And here's, here's the thing about that, though. If you upgrade your spiritual life, everything in life goes up. Your marriage goes up. Your parenting challenges, it gets a whole lot better. You, everything gets better when your relationship to God through His Son, Jesus Christ, is getting better. Now, I recognize... Some of you, when we use the word upgrade, you say, oh, that's awesome. I, I got upgraded to a better seat on the plane. Uh, at, uh, sometimes an upgrade's a good thing. And some of you, you've had bad experiences with upgraded. You upgraded your computer and it runs slower. You upgraded some program and it just doesn't work as well. You upgraded your phone and your battery life shrunk dramatically. You upgraded your kitchen. You remodeled the kitchen and then you had to remodel the rest of the house to match it. And it was a terrible decision on your part. Okay. Here's what I want to assure you of. When you upgrade your relationship to God, it's going to be all good. It's going to involve some changes probably. Some things you adjust. But you're not going to regret an upgrade to your spiritual life. And what I want you to know is that God's not done with your spiritual life. Wherever you are in the journey, from a new believer to someone who's been a believer for decades, he's not done with you, and he doesn't stop at, okay, I'm at version 1.0 or 2.0 or 3.0, and now that's as far as I go. I've known plenty of folks that that's how they did it. Well, I've been doing stuff and growing and trying and leaning into it for decades, and this is the version I like, and I'm just going to settle on this version of relationship to God and be quite satisfied to be right here for the rest of my life. And God has better and bigger plans for your life than settling on anything with Him. However, the inclination of our hearts, I think, is always to settle, to, to, to just ease off of the gas, tap the brakes a little bit and say, and here is where I'm going to ride it out. People say, you know, I've changed, I've adjusted, I've taken next steps with God for a long time, but I'm happy where I am, and I'm going to settle in right here. However, my observations of people over a lot of, a few, several decades now of ministry, and we have, a, we have a lot of study that happens now in the Christian world. We have arms of uh, Christian world that are, are doing some pretty intense demographic studies of what's going on in the church and what's going on with Christians and here's what happens people do get to that spot and they say I'm all done this far as I go and so I'm going to drop anchor and then I'm going to hold my ground right here but that's not how it works for anybody the second you think you're dropping anchor and I'm going to stay here you start sliding backwards so fast it'll take your breath away that's what happens that's where the road goes when you decide I'm not going another step further with God. And here's what happens. And man, this is the real tragedy of uh, modern American Christianity. Because a whole lot of people in our cultural Christianity world that we live in right now, over the last 10 years in American Christianity particularly, they said, this is how far I go. And the unchurched crowd of people who used to go to church is dramatic. I got into a conversation, uh, since uh, unusual circumstances, and a conversation with a woman in December. And in this conversation, not a part of us uh, here, anybody, probably nobody, you, any of you would know. But we got into this conversation. She's about my age, and she's telling me about her and her husband. And she said, you know, we, well, we've, we have been active in church, but, you know, part of church made commitments to Christ early on in life. And, you know, we, we taught Sunday school and served in mission trips, and, and we, we, we just have done it all, church leaders. And then she said, then we, we moved because the kids, kids had gone off, you know, empty nesters now. And so, uh, downsized a little bit moved to another community a little further away from their church than they had been and she said uh, there have been some you know family stuff and some things with work and she said I realized I haven't been my husband I haven't been to church for anything except a funeral in over a year 
And it happened in a matter of just a few months. Everything shifted. Everything changed. And suddenly somebody that was close to God, serving the Lord, wakes up and they are far from God. And that's, that's what we don't want to happen with anybody. God is a God of grace and glory and he will bring you home from wherever you've drifted. That's how God does things. You just have to decide. There were some careless people back in the Old Testament and they drifted. They didn't just run from God. They didn't deny God. They, they just let it slide and let it slide. And the prophet Haggai, he came at him and the word of the Lord and he said, think carefully about your ways. And that's, I think, where it breaks down this relationship to God thing is that we just don't stop and say, where am I in relationship to God? Where am I supposed to be in relationship to God? What am I going to do about it? We just don't reflect. We don't take time to, to explore. Now, even those m most faithful to God occasionally need to pause and think and evaluate. I use... I use the end of December as my time to look back at a lot of things in my life and look forward at a lot of things in the new year. And some of you have been doing some of those same exercises, but the truth is it's easy just to bump along, right? You just go from one busy week to the next busy week and, and, and you realize I haven't really been intentional about anything in my discipleship, my following after God. The Bible, when it talks about the Christian life, it talks about it with this active language. It's a race. It's a battle. It's a, it's a pursuit. It's a war. It's training in godliness. You strive for it. Active words. And we can get passive in a short uh, amount of time when it comes to following Almighty God. And so we want to talk about some things that might just help you to have an upgrade and how things are working with you and God and that relationship and that fellowship in 2020. So, upgrade. Now, there are a lot of different ways to attack this. And uh, what I'd like for you to do is open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You're going to run into a couple of Thessalonians after that. And if you do, you've overshot your target. We're in Colossians chapter 3, which Colossians is such a sweeping, beautiful, powerful uh, book. And we're going to look at chapter 3, and we're going to read a little of this as we go along, as we talk about uh, what it looks like to follow the Lord and some challenges that are given to us here. Some, you say, oh, I expect that at the beginning of the year. And some of them, you say, that was nowhere on my radar for what God might be stirring in me. So here we go. Here's the first thing. And you have, by the way, you have ample outline today. Uh, you'll be out well before the Cowboys kick off next year. Okay. <laughs> Resolve to live with eternity in mind. Okay. Resolve to live in this new year with eternity in mind. Verses 1 and 2. So you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Things that are above. Live in anticipation of eternal things and eternity. Now, God's eternal perspective. Here's, here's how this helps me. And there's a lot of testimony in this. For me, I can get so in the trenches, so right now, so checking the boxes uh, here's my to-do list here's my challenge here are my challenges and I just start knocking things out problem solving and doing all those things and after a while this is going to wear you out and wear you down and you're going to get discouraged and you're going to be frustrated and stressed and what the eternal perspective does to be heavenly minded makes you of more earthly good we don't spend enough time thinking about heaven we're going to spend some more time working on this uh, later this year. We need to spend more time thinking about eternity and about eternal things because we're going to be there a lot. As a follower of Christ, I'm going to be in heaven a lot longer than I'm going to be here. And it just helps to write some things in my spirit when things are hard, when I am struggling. Uh, 
you hear this kind of language all the time. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. It's too much. I feel hopeless. There's no escape. No way out. I feel, I feel trapped. And, and those feelings are, are pretty common. And I can get into a rut. And I can be just hurrying from one thing to the next. And uh, what, what the eternal perspective does is it just helps me to see this is not forever. In fact, this is just a blip on the screen of God's economy of eternity. And even suffering doesn't make much difference because it's not for long. And it actually is for my good and God's glory if I'll lean into it rightly. And God's work in long term on my struggles and even if it's my health I've had my health stuff as many of you have my relationships work all those things are just for a season or for just a day and I recognize in my walk with the Lord and I've, I've actually I've actually uh, tried to encourage this in my life I am a simpleton I am not a complex thinker on these things because this is one of the spots where a childlike kind of faith and walk with God really writes things in me and so for me I, I want to I want to recognize that knowing in Christ there's a time when I'm just not going to have problems anymore and that just gives me all I need for today and I'll rehearse that in my head until I feel it in my heart. Here's the second thing. Resolve to kill sin. This is, ver this is verses 5 and 6. And, and this will help you in the upgrade. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. And he gives some examples. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. Just kill your sin. What is more common than killing sin? What's more common than killing our sin is managing our sin. Getting our sin to an acceptable, palatable level. Getting rid of the things that make us look bad in public, but hanging on to the things that uh, aren't quite so apparent. And we rationalize it. Absolutely, we rationalize it when it comes to sin. We we do it mostly by comparing ourselves with other people. Again, just take a moment. Look at the people seated around you. You're better than a lot of those people. There's some terrible people on your row right now. If you only knew what was going on in their lives, you would sit on the other side of the building. No. That's not how God does this. It's not a comparative analysis of who's better and who's worse. Now, one of the things we do is we do celebrate. Well, I had this problem, and I got it taken care of. I knocked it out. I'm celebrating where I kill sin. And I'm also hanging on and doing a little celebrating of the sin I hung on to. Listen, resolve in 2022, kill sin. No mercy. Devote it to complete destruction. Maybe it's identifying the people, the factors, the circumstances that are trigger points for you with your sin. Whatever that is. And there's a thousand and one things that it could be in your life different from my story. But what's your trigger point for your sin and decide in your heart when the trigger is about to be fired, you run the other way as fast as you can go. You flee from temptation. We'll spend a whole, a whole sermon in, uh, later in the spring on... Uh, on uh, overcoming temptation having victory over temptation because that's where the battle's fought we would do so much cleanup work what if we just didn't fall off the cliff in the first place what if we put better guardrails up front to protect us from sin and that's what we want to work on as we move forward in the year but decide in your heart flee from temptation the bible says this resolution glorifies god who sent his son to pay for your sin and when you're tempted to sin, just remember the price Jesus had to pay for it. Maybe that will repel you. That I don't want, I don't want to celebrate or embrace or move forward in an area of my life that nailed Jesus to the cross. Third, resolve to pursue holiness. Now this is kind of the other side of the coin. 
Therefore, as God's chosen ones, this is verses 12 and 14. I am not reading in order because I have a microphone. I can do it any way I want to. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on, like you're dressing for the day, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So killing sin is taken as the process for some people of just being a good person. Uh, I could be completely comatose and be a good Christian in many people's mind because I'm not doing bad stuff. I'm just laying there, stuck. Well, you know, avoiding sin is not just not doing the bad stuff. It's also doing the good stuff. There are a whole set of things that God says, you should do these things. It's not just a thou shalt not Faith And a lot of people like to paint their Christian faith that way. What, what the Christian life is, is you're going on a journey with God. That's what discipleship is. You're walking through life with Jesus. And we want to do that well. And that means there are things that you do. So one side, you're killing sin. The other side, you're pursuing holiness. Both of those are active things. And what's your motivation my identity in Christ this is who I am in Christ because of what Christ did for me because I belong to him because I am a child of God I'm a part of his family uh, I, I'm, I'm a new creation I'm an ambassador all those things that are a part of our identity in Christ those are, those are my motivators that's the badge I put on I want to be known by and just as putting, putting sin to death is active putting on things like the fruit of the spirit is active I put on he says put on love which is the first of the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against this thing, there is no law. And so I think he says that because some people seem to think it's against the rules to do that stuff. Well, go ahead and do that stuff. It's good stuff. It also shows this. It shows you belong in God's family. When those things are put on, it's, a, it's an evidence that you belong in God's family. And that may sound weird, but here's how Jesus said it. My Father is glorified in this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. I want you to let that soak in a little bit. If you remember the parable of the sower, the whole thing is not, uh, well, there's some leaf there that you see, or there's some movement there in the soil because the, the seed is germinated. It's fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. The things that the Bible talks about is fruit. There's something that's being produced by the life. And so this whole thing of the whole of living a holy life is evidence you belong to, to Jesus. And sometimes you need that evidence. And some, sometimes your testimony is being damaged in the world because nobody else is seeing it either. Nobody else has seen anything different in you. And this is one of the things that we find, again, in the research of Christian world in America. What people who are far from God say is, I know these people who go to church, I know these people who claim to be a Christian, I know these people who say they belong to Jesus, but their life isn't any different than my life. And if they don't make any decisions any different than my decisions, why do I need to be a part of that movement? Why do I need to be a part of those people? We ought to stand apart by the life that we live and how we point people to Christ. Fourth, resolve to be thankful. This is one I'm actually working hard on. Uh, by the way, I'm going to give you this whole list of eight things. But some of them are going to ring your bell more than others. This one, resolve to be thankful. This from verse 15. And let the peace of Christ, to which you are also called in one body, rule your hearts. And be thankful. Just be thankful. The fruit of a life of holiness is the peace of Christ ruling in your hearts. When you start walking with Jesus, you start having a lot of peace about things that used to stir you up. And uh, man, when, you, when you're under the good protection of God's word and God's ways, there's no truer you than standing in that identity as his child. And There's a whole lot of peace, like a child walking with a parent across the street. They find a lot of peace, not because the cars are going any slower or faster but because mom and dad are taking care of me and that's where your peace comes in walking through life with the Lord and when you have that kind of life it's going to make you thankful 
an attitude of thankfulness when we realize I just have and I see this in my life I have a whole lot more good than bad in my life I have a lot to for which to be grateful it's in its earthly blessings I don't recognize them family and all the other things wrapped around me I have a lot to be thankful for in spiritual blessings I got a long track record of walking with the Lord that I can point back to things I can point to things uh I actually point to some things this morning. And they all come from this endless store of God's goodness and God's wisdom and God's grace. I, I, I just have much for which to be grateful. Most of us are good evaluators. We live in a culture of evaluation. We go online and we give our opinion about everything. We share our opinions freely on social media about everything. And we, we, we have... Uh, we're evaluating books and movies and fashion. We evaluate other people. We evaluate ourselves and we evaluate our circumstances. We're always evaluating. And for me, this is, a, this is my statement. I do hereby resolve in 2020, I'm going to be a whole lot more thankful. And I'm going to rehearse the things for which I'm thankful every day. So that's my resolve for 2020. One that's just really mission specific to me in this particular category. It's something that I count my many deficits, name them one by one, and I think about all the things the Lord has not done. Instead of count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done, the old hymn says. So let's, uh, let's do this and do it well. Five. Uh, here we go. We love the Bible at First Baptist Church Allen. Resolve to read it and meditate on it. Don't use it as a paperweight. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. I like that. It, it takes up residence with you in a big, beautiful way. H how are we going to know what sin is? How are we going to know who we are as God's children or what the fruit of the Spirit is if we do not read and meditate on the revealed word of God? And so, Soak this book in every day. Go to our church website. We have a, just a whole stack of reading plans. And once you get to that, uh, again, the, the Gideons have, have a plan. And it'll read it to you. And if you're learning a new language, this will be a great opportunity for you because they have it in a lot of languages too. So there you go. Learn your language at the same time. Uh, the, the Bible app, uh, YouVersion. The, there's things, how can I get better at my marriage? And there are Bible readings every day for that. And I, I have not said this so far this year. Now, I'm reading, I'm reading through my Bible. I'll read through uh, last year. I made uh, one and two-thirds of the way through the Bible in 2019. So 2020, I'll finish up that last third in the next probably month. And then I'll get my new Bible that's sitting on my shelf, and I'll take off with that one to finish the year. Now, now I can do that. It doesn't take very long. It's like 15 minutes a day, and I can read the Bible in a year. And I'm highlighting, so it means I'm reading it twice already. You can do this and read the New Testament in a year. There are great reading plans for that. Things specific to you, but spend time in God's Word. This is not, this is not a hard exercise, and I see so much fruit in it. My own life... Uh, I don't have any problem selling this to anybody. But make it a habit. Let God speak into your life every day. And I, I do encourage you to read early in the day. I know some of you say, I'm not a morning person. But just remember, when it comes to the Bible and prayer, if the only time you're right with God is when you're asleep, because you did it just before you went to sleep, that's probably okay, but it's not awesome. What if you were right with God all day while you're walking around bumping into people? That'd be pretty cool. Spend time with the Lord early in your day. Number six, man, this is a big one. Resolve to commit to a local church. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. This is just one of the many one another passages about what it means to be a part of God's people. When we finish off this series of upgrade, we're moving into a series of uh, together. What it means to be a church, what it means to do things together, to love one another. And that's going to be our next journey where we're going to dig in. This year, I'm telling you, if you have not landed in a local church, and we have always have guests, people who maybe regular attenders, but you haven't made a commitment to a local church, we go through we go through our commitments. And I want to challenge you to make a commitment to be a part of a local church. If it's not this one, you say, Well, I'm looking for a church that does it this way or that way. I can help you maybe find that church. So I'm glad to do referrals. I really 
We've said, because of our community outreach, one of the things that we have said for a long time over and over again is, we're about building God's kingdom, not our kingdom. And so we want to help people connect. So if you're not a part of a local church, be a part of a local church and not just drifting in, drifting out. I ha- when I, and I'll, I'll do this in a sermon in great detail uh, later in the spring. But the majority of churches that are even Bible teaching churches in our area don't, don't do, they have the slide in, slide out thing. Draw in a crowd. They don't know anybody in the crowd, but they just, just drift back out again. The other thing is the majority of churches that even are Bible teaching churches that have people showing up every Sunday, they have a fraction of that worship attendance, a tiny fraction. They're in any kind of small group experience. In Sunday school, or we call our Bible fellowship groups here, nobody's grouping up with anybody else. So you're still flying solo, sitting as a stranger alone in a crowd. And uh, man, we don't want to do it that way. If in our church, if you're not a part of a group, we want to make you feel really awkward about that. And we're going to push you to, to get into a group because we just grow better, serve better, care better when we do it together. And are people messy? Absolutely. You are messy and I am messy. And together, we're going to grow to reflect the bride of Christ, his church. And so let's, uh, let's get into a group. If you have been in a group and you say, you know, I'm really not connecting or my, I'm just in a change. I'm, I'm in a different season of my life now and I'm not feeling connected where I am. Then try another group. You have a get out of jail free card to go to anybody else's group. You're not going to hurt anybody else's feelings. What, what really gets hurt is when you're out there just dangling by yourself uh, at the end of a string, vulnerable and alone, instead of being a part of the body of Christ. We want you to be in a group when you're here. And so make the effort. You need both of those things working in tandem to grow and to take the next steps God wants you to take. Believers who remain isolated are easy pickings for Satan's temptations. It just keeps you safe spiritually. It's a good place to lean into hearing the gospel, learning the gospel, sharing the gospel, spurring one another on to gospel-centered living, being accountable outside of that structure. I'm telling you, that's when people fall through the cracks and that's when they get super inactive. And... uh, Spiritual gifts don't get exercised. How God organized the churches with spiritual gifts. And, and if you're out there flying solo, by the way, this is not just about you. What do I get out of it? It's also, not only do you get a whole lot of benefit package, but there's somebody who's waiting for you, who needs you in the body of Christ in a church. So think about it on that side of the game. Who needs me? Who, who, do I, who did God put me in this church or in my group that I can minister to them. And that's a big part of this picture. Commit to local church this year. Now, resolve to worship. This is, this is, okay, this is the outlier, but it's in here. Verse 16, admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Resolve to worship God through song. Okay. Now, I know a lot of you are non-singers. I'm not so much a singer. And we're, we're an entertainment culture where we go and we hear other people sing. We don't hear the professionals sing. I, you know, I, even in the shower, it's, not, it's ugly. I, I don't want to hear me sing. I'm grateful there's enough of us. I don't have to hear me sing on Sunday morning. Poor Jeffrey here, he had to sit next to me this morning. He got to experience some of that, but sometimes it happens. But still, we are com- this isn't just a, hey, let's just get together, sit, do sing if you feel like it. It's a command in the Bible, and not just here, but in a lot of other places. You don't get it out on this one. And I know some of you are terrible singers. I'm one of, I'm one of you. We're to, together. But it doesn't say, unless you're, unless you're not good at it. I've been in several different uh, cultures in our missions in Africa. Zambia, those people are the best singers ever. They're the ultimate, uh, uh, they're just, they they sing their parts. It's unbelievably gifted 
uh, vocalists in that culture of Christianity. And I've been to another country where they're just horrible. They, they really, they couldn't blend well. They couldn't stay in tune. It was just, and I'm just saying, not everybody's a singer and not every culture is a singing culture. But you know what? The one who wasn't really like, oh man, this is awesome. It was still awesome. You know why? Because they sang with all their hearts un, because they weren't singing for me anyway. They were singing for the Lord and they let loose with great enthusiasm and passion. What a blessing it was to be with those folks. I wouldn't buy a recording of them singing it. But it was pretty, pretty overwhelming. And so, be a singing people. We sing to the glory of God. And it's a great way to express our joy, our thanks, our heart for Him. So let it fly with all your vocal cords can muster. Number eight. How many of you didn't think we'd get to number eight? I'm still... Well, that's kind of hurtful. Uh, trying to see through my lights. Okay. I'm, a, I'm early. I'll, I'm going to talk about... I'm going to tell you some old stories about high school. <laughs> Number eight. Resolve to aim for the glory of Christ. Boy, this is a great verse in Colossians. One of my favorites. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do. And that's a tough one. Because uh, that means that it can't all be about me. Because whatever I do, I'm doing it for him. And, and that means that on this little throne of my life, I've got to get off the throne, and God's going to sit on that throne of my life. He is Lord. He is master. He is king. And uh, you're probably going to have to climb off that throne a lot of times during the course of the day to make sure he's still in the right spot. It means idolizing self-glory, self-worship, self-pursuits are not God's agenda for our life. Everything for the glory of Christ. Now, here's all this stuff. And you say, and I say, how's it, how's it possible to do any of this? Well, this is one tall order, right? Well, here's our means and motivation. We're going to go back and pick up verses 3 and 4. Paul says to the Colossians, for you died. Because there's a lot of things that have to die for all this to happen. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. It's not because you're just going to try harder. It's not because you're going to be a better time manager. It's not because of your self-effort that any of this stuff happens. It is the gift of God's grace. Spiritual growth, the upgrade we're calling it. I am saved by grace, not because of anything I did or anything I have done. I'm saved by grace through faith. And you know what? The Bible says this too. I grow by grace. I stay saved by grace. Galatians tells us it's all by grace. The gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel is not something we do. It's something God has done. God gives us then when you get saved, when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you to help you accomplish, to guide you, to call you, to convict you about all these things about growing to be more like Christ. And it, the only way you, you're going to have to die to some of your own stuff so you can take up your cross and follow him. All right? Now, once again, that's all you have to do to grow. Just that. And those are some tall orders. And uh, we're going to be striving at that from now until Jesus comes again or we go to meet him for sure. But we know it is not easy because it was easy. I'd be a lot better at it than I am right now. So I want to give you some things. And there's some overlap in these things, but these are the wheels upon which the upgrade runs. These things all just help the other things work better together. And if these things are missing, it's not going to work. So we'll go through these quickly. The first thing, admit you can't do this. How about that? Admit you can't do everything on your own. Just say, I, I, can't, I can't do this. I can't make this happen. I can't make this growth happen. I've tried, and I'm just out of my league on this, not by, again, better time management, trying harder. And so what we need to do is to admit to God exactly that. God, I can't do that. Here's where I'm struggling. Here's the one, out of those eight things that Paul mentioned in Colossians earlier, 
Here's the one I'm not very good at. Here's the one where I just keep beating my head against the wall and it just never gets any better. God, I need your help. There's something about the nature of God that said multiple times in Scripture, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He's looking for some humility from us. He's just waiting for us to say, I, I need you. And when we call out to him, he honors that prayer. So a lot of this is, he must increase, I must decrease, as uh, John the baptizer said. I need him. Uh, that just orients everything in our spirit for growth. The, the next thing is to remove yourself from harmful relationships. And I won't take too long on this. This is a lot of sorting out. But we all have relationships. And you have relationships that really spur you on to grow and to become and to be more like Christ. And you have other relationships, maybe close relationships, maybe just the brush up against you during the course of a day at work or something. Relationships that truthfully, they are knocking you backwards every time you're in that relationship. You can't just discard all of them, but you can determine how close you're walking with people who are walking you in the wrong direction. So just look at those relationships, evaluate them, and see in the midst of everything, is this person helping me to be more like Jesus, or is it really hurting my walk with Christ? Third, get plugged into a local church and small group. And we've already talked about that at length, but uh, it's the catalyst that just gives you the accountability, the wisdom, the encouragement, the ministry in times of distress that you're going to need. And uh, none of this works apart from community. So we want to keep focusing on that this year. Fourth, read your Bible. I had this conversation uh, not too long ago, a couple weeks ago. Someone said, I just, I'm frustrated. And I've had this conversation hundreds of times probably. Many of you have too. Where someone says, I'm going through a difficult time and I just can't hear God. It's just like God, God is not speaking to me. And my response to them, to you is, he's speaking all the time. This is the word, this is God's voice. And he's talking all the time. And the more time you spend here, the more those mission-specific things that you want to know about become clear too. God is always speaking, and that statement is a statement that says, you're not spending time in God's Word. Spend time in God's Word, and God will speak to you. The fifth thing is to make prayer a priority, and prayer is key in all these things. And I think we've made prayer way too complicated where it has to be some kind of uh, oratorical masterpiece of uh, King James English and beauty and uh, we just made it too complicated what if we made prayer a conversation with God where it's just talking to God like you talk to your friend you talk to your family just talk to God and again with humility you go into the conversation and you ask God to help you build a relationship with him Martin Luther the reformer once said to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. And, well, that's right on target in all kinds of ways. There's a lot of truth in that statement. To, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. And so much of our praying is just fine. One, one of my commitments is I restructured my prayer life again to bring freshness, a different focus to it, and uh, really enjoying my prayer time in uh, these uh, last I started that in December and so I'm really enjoying that experience any relationship it, if it's, it's a marriage if it's a friendship it, it's not going to work very well unless you're good communicators communication drives good relationship and if you're not communicating well with the Lord you're not intentional about it then just start talking to God about what's going on in your life and start talking to God about what you're reading in, in this book. And God can do miraculous things in your life. It is time for us to do some spiritual upgrades. And uh, for you, there may be one or two of those. It just hits you a whole lot clearer right now in this season than the others. Lean in to the ones that God has already kind of just bumped you on this morning okay yeah that's that's me that's where it needs to be different that's where it needs to change you may you may have a step in all eight of these things but there's most certainly at least one
What are you going to do next? And what you do next determines what you really believe about obeying God and listening to his call and following Jesus.